Hello, and welcome to the Loop Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Elise Stieferman, Director of Marketing at Kwegi. Today, we're joined by Kwegi's President, Sean Cotton, and Vice President of Marketing, Ryan Green. Let's get started. All right, so today we're talking about one of my favorite subjects, and a popular one for Kwegi, Connected TV. So, obviously, Kwegi was an early emerger into the space, saw a lot of potential with CTV for brands, especially those who maybe weren't able to tap into linear because it was cost, cost prohibitive or you know, whatever reason. So how do you see television in general evolving over the next five years, knowing that cord cutters are becoming more prevalent and just the way people are consuming television is changing? Sure. Well, technology is going to continue to drive cord cutting in that, you know, for the last several years now, internet uh, connected televisions are just flooding the market, right? That's mm -hmm. the only thing that manufacturers even produce at mm -hmm. this point. So ones may still be watching in a linear environment. They may buy their internet connected television and still have their cable subscription or tune in to their their network stations, but as they become more familiar with this technology, pretty much all generations now realize, hey, I can watch what I want when I want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, if I'm a home and garden enthusiast, you know, I'm going to subscribe to HDTV or Discovery Plus, or if I'm a uh, Marvel fan, you know, Disney Plus, and people are realizing that they can choose the content that they want and watch it when they want across all generations and so this streaming adoption uh, on the tv is just going to continue to grow now the flip side of that is is all of these streaming options are available there's a tipping point as to what people are willing to tolerate in terms of their wallet <laughs> that they're they're willing to dedicate towards that right so there's only going to be certain services that they want to monthly pay a subscription to. And so we will see the rise of advertising funded streaming television, premium content, uh, television shows and movies, I believe, you know, even more so over the next few years. It'd be hard for us to um, see the amount of change um, that we saw the past five years over the next five years, everything that really changed with both the pandemic um, the availability of um, internet connected televisions as a primary um, television resource. I think to y your point, Sean, we're certainly gonna see more advertising supported um, streaming services as there's more of a proliferation of options. Um, even Netflix is likely gonna go to some type of ad supported model. You saw that with uh, HBO for the first time, which. Um, from the advertising uh, side is um, very exciting. And now Disney Plus too. Disney Plus. Um, so with that, publishers are also going to get more savvy about releasing more inventory programmatically. And I think one of the faults that we've seen um, from streaming currently, um, although it's quickly changing, was very high frequency um, of uh, when there was they were tied to the upfronts. Uh, a lot of times upfronts were overestimating uh, viewership um, and were having to jam a lot of impressions in front of a smaller audience um, than expected. But as we see a lot more private marketplace inventory coming through, I think we're gonna see a lot of the advantages that um, advertisers can use to control frequency to be more targeted um, from an addressability standpoint. And a lot of the hopes and dreams that we had five years ago for uh, television actually coming to life. And you're already seeing that with IMB TV uh, through Amazon, um, you know, and being able to see that in, a, um, in Hulu and a variety of really great inventory sources that we're able to um, align contextually um, and, uh, and with addressability um, for our brands and advertisers. Why do you think some brands have been hesitant to uh, divide their budget away from linear if they've historically used that and begin to dip their toes into CTV? Obviously, there's the reach component. I mean, you are it's familiar. 
I think linear is still an easier thing to understand and buy against. Um, it's what they're used to. Um, you still have generations of media buyers that speak in uh, GRP that understand the upfronts. Publishers, too, um, still want to transact in that legacy model. So I think there's um, a hesitancy from um, a lot of the larger agencies that are incentivized to, to do it the old way. There's also, for a long time, has been hesitancy from publishers and certainly from the, the cable providers that would allow, do have the technology to allow for addressable um, a advertising that they just haven't had a financial need, means to do so. With what we've seen over the pandemic, though, and you know the control that users have on when, where, and how they're going to consume video content um, across their cell phones from um, seeing the proliferation of TikTok and, and, and increase in, in YouTube as well, there's a lot more competition for eyeballs, um, even, for, even on the TV perspective. So I think because of that, there needs to be more flexibility and nimbleness um, that publishers are starting to, to be able to lean into to make that inventory available. Um, programmatically so that smaller budgets do have a chance um, to be able to show their ads in the same place that national advertisers are able to as well. And from the buy side, uh, linear TV has typically been measured much differently than the way you can measure, mm -hmm. you know, connected television. And, and you cannot measure connected television the way you do linear TV, which is based on modeling of groups of people in a one to many delivery format, whereas connected television is really one to one per household. So because the measurement models are so different, uh, there's, there's just been this temptation to keep them separated and, and to put the CTV in that digital bucket, in that digital environment. But what savvy marketers have started to see is that as the proliferation of, of a streaming television uh, takes place as a part of the overall pie of all television viewing is that the only way you can accomplish those traditional goals of reaching an appropriate frequency is having the right mix yeah. of connected television and linear because otherwise what's going to happen is you still can't build reach faster than linear at this point. That's the fastest way to reach large groups of people quickly. But that point of diminishing returns is much uh, uh, sooner, comes much sooner than yeah. what it used to, to where it doesn't make sense for you to invest more dollars in that channel uh, because the incremental reach that you're obtaining um, doesn't justify that cost. But what savvy marketers are realizing is that when they reach that point, they can now apply their connected television by in a way that it provides profitable incremental reach. Yep. Uh, but they have to measure it differently. It can't be the standard GRP and TRPs. It has to be more based upon a, uh, a CPM basis, a unique reach uh, basis. And um, as people become more accustomed to measuring their TV in that way, I think we'll see more of a convergence of, of those channels in the same budget pool. When we started, um Kalegi, eight years ago, we were, we've been on TV for a long time. Um, and it used to be that we were promoting that fifth quintile as something that you could um, have more efficient reach for on digital. Now, you'd be hard pressed to get to that third quintile of adults 18 plus by just buying on um, linear TV. You have to mix in connected TV and other video uh, formats if you're really going to get to 80, 90% reach. It's impossible to do. Um, now, that kind of easy button of linear with that, that first 50% is still very attractive. It really is. But it's not a complete mix. And just like so many things in marketing, you have to be able to um, take a look at the all of the tools that are available to you. And it's you're, there are very few brands that are going to be able to build um, it, to really to, to build and generate demand, new demand 
um, and, and new awareness of their brand through one channel anymore. Like maybe with the exception of um, class action lawsuit lawyers on, on billboards, um, you're, you have to be able to take a multi-pronged, um, multi-channel approach, um, whether it, it's on, on video or with digital or with social or, or, tra or other traditional channels. There's very few that are going to be one-trick ponies anymore. It makes it more challenging to buy media, um, but it does give you a lot more um, prescriptive um, tools that are available to really reach your audience impactful in impactful ways. You know, thinking about CTV from a digital perspective, something we talk about on digital in terms of creative is how do we stop the scroll with an mm -hmm. ad with CTV and even linear? What can marketers do to stop the mute? How can we keep mm -hmm. them engaged in those 15 or 30 seconds that is perhaps feeling, if it's a poor creative, interruptive of their, mm -hmm. their experience? Well, one simple um, way to do that is take a look at your creative link. You know, the standard 30 is not necessarily the best solution for every brand. You know, in uh, the CTV environment, perhaps a 15 second spot is all you need to communicate your brand message and, and, and have that, that call to action for the consumer. I think taking it off of the big screen short form video in the terms of like even six second videos is, is something uh, to look at. There are some ad formats as regards interactive mm -hmm. uh, ad units and CTV. There's limited scale for that, but I know in one campaign that we ran and it had the QR code on it before the infamous Coinbase mm -hmm. commercial, we actually did that mm -hmm. on CTV. Mm -hmm. And we actually did see a lot of engagement from that QR code on the website. There wasn't enough scale there, right, for that to, um, you know, accomplish all of our all of our campaign objectives. But it did give us a really strong signal as to, you know, where we were driving engagement in that channel and things that we can learn from. Uh, I think the other thing to think of in terms of, you know, our engaging with our creative is getting to the point quickly, having our brand up front in the first few seconds mm -hmm. um, and, and engaging, you know, that viewer as soon as possible. Um, and then in the CTV environment, addressability is also, you know, very important because if it's relevant to the person that's viewing the ad, they are going to lean in a little bit more versus just like you say, you know, walk away or go make a sandwich or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, automation is going to give a lot more data to the creatives when you're doing testing. So we're, if you take a look at maybe running something on YouTube, you would be able to see when people mute and when people skip. Um, and if you're running some Petri dishes there before uh, making larger commitments to either connected TV or to linear, you can have a pretty good idea of which audiences are um, responding already, you almost have a pre-optimized creative uh, campaign that way. So because you get a lot more metadata on each um, iteration of creative and the addressability to understand the audiences um, that are uh, inter their interplay with that creative, um, it's actually pretty straightforward to make some of those comparisons. Um, to, and I would say it's becoming more of a prerequisite um, for uh, the creative and media teams to find those opportunities to think about what's our communication strategy going to be? How, what micro-targeting are we able to execute through connected TV? What messages may resonate to each of those audiences in those environments? And how can we test some hypotheses? If you're not doing that, I'd say that you're behind, right? So when we think about addressability and personalization on CTV, is there any impact you all predict with the cookie list future on how it impacts that particular channel and the efficacy and the, the scale? Well, it may impact it uh, less than the majority of others because there are not cookies that are associated with um, connected TV. Now, there's still, um, a, there's still cookies that are underwriting some of the uh, data un underneath that that may still have some effect, 
you may not have as much metadata associated with a connected TV device um, as you may have for cross device from matching. cross from cross yeah. device mapping that will have some mm -hmm. deprecation, um, but you're still going to have a fairly rich data set to be able to understand the households that you're talking to, the programs that they're watching. Um, there's still ACR technology that's able to um, listen in on um, and be able to do comp competitive conquesting um, that are still going to provide a lot of signals in a privacy compliant way that um, should be attractive to uh, brands and advertisers. Would you agree, Sean? Yeah, I think we'll see a growth in CTV as a result of the cookie deprecation, especially when it's tied to campaigns that are measuring actual business results and goals. And we've seen this over and over again as well, that when we adjust our mix uh, to a higher funnel execution such as CTV, that it, it lifts all other <laughs> oh, yeah. campaign performance metrics, search, right, uh, you know, website engagement and so forth. And the reason why a lot of advertisers haven't done that to date is because it's not trackable to the typical online digital metrics for conversion. Right? It's not trackable to clicks. Yeah, to clicks, right? And so, uh, but when we change that lens through which we're viewing performance, we realize that it's that mix of, of targeted views on the big screen along with you know, the ad recall messages through our display and through social and then search for conversion all working together that, you know, drives the best business results. I think the deprecation of cookies really helps CTV as a channel because it's going to increase the uh, volume of incremental measurement of media mix modeling. And those two models um, generally produce better results for the non-clickable um, environments. Um, Master, or excuse me, American Express um, was able to show um, predictive growth from audio to um, credit card signups about three weeks later. So they were able to understand their life cycle um, up from uh, top of funnel all the way down to conversion by doing some of the things that may be old school, like a medium mix modeling, right? That are more directional, um, that aren't slaves to the clicks um, that are able to show the full picture. So being able to, to do similar things with connected TV, to do that with out of home and traditional, I think are gonna be really powerful for really uh, having a, a, a more accurate source of truth for CMOs to, to take a look at when they're, they're evaluating um, how their media is performing in market. So to, to wrap up, what are three key advantages for brands to lean into CTV now or begin testing that channel if they are, haven't already? Well, uh, the measurement, right? You know, measure what matters. So if you um, are uh, a marketer that does a lot with video, uh, what CTV or otherwise, if you're able to put in some media mix modeling and start to learn um, adjustments that you can make uh, from an incremental approach, you're, you're light years ahead of uh, a number of the, those other brands. Um, lean into addressability too. Um, I mean, that's, that's still very powerful and is an advantage that you're gonna have from um, some of your sister brands that may be only on linear and are buying on GRPs or on index. And then really start to understand um, the context in which uh, your, your, show, your, your ads are appearing. Um, there's more publisher data that's going to be available from sign-in data, um, you know, within app environments that are also going to be powerful um, and will start to allow you to, uh, to get more granular on the programming that, that you select as well. Um, you know, having those uh, publisher direct um, relationships, whether you're an agency or a brand, are uh, um, important things to be able to leverage as we um, you know, move into the cookie-less future. Great. Thank you both for being here. Thank Thanks you, Elise. Thank you for listening. Kwegi is an industry-leading performance marketing agency based in the Midwest. We've learned a lot since our founding in 2014 and started the Loop Marketing Podcast to share some of our hot takes on marketing trends we're following. 
best practices we discovered and actionable tips for improving your digital strategy. We'll see you next time.